Today, I'm gonna to look at some surgically oriented medical memes, and I'm gonna tell you whether they are right or wrong, and whether I like them or not. Let's get to it. I love this first meme because it is so representative of what we see in clinical practice regularly. The placebo effect describes the patient's response to a particular medication or treatment that is designed to have no therapeutic value. It is known to be somewhat effective in the treatment of a number of medical problems or disorders. This basically means that a treatment can have no measurable medicinal effect, but that in a significant proportion of those treated with this treatment, their belief in the treatment will allow them to respond to it, especially when the condition being treated is of a subjective nature. For example, pain. You can tell patients all the time that they just need to do X, Y, or Z to treat their problem and they won't believe you. However, the second you tell them that you can give them a pill to treat the issue, they are all in. There is this perception that we need this secret sauce to fix ourselves and we tend to discount our own ability to change and potentially heal ourselves. This certainly doesn't apply to everything, but it applies to way more than we think it might. This is so ortho. But it really isn't just because we want to overkill everything or because we just like spending a lot of freaking money. As surgeons, our goal is to fix fractures in the simplest way possible with the implant that is most suited for the job in the safest way that we can. Certain fracture or injury patterns are ideally suited to particular implants. Those implants are specifically designed for the characteristics of the fracture pattern. Basically, we use what works for the fracture. These days, most implants are constructed from titanium because it is a metal whose properties closely mimic those of bone. The implants are lighter, more durable and offer less stress shielding than does surgical stainless steel. Yes, they are more expensive, but their improved characteristics may lead to better healing outcomes and potentially less complications. This may lead to lower cost in the long run. In addition, nobody wants to hear, yo, your grandma is 95 pounds, so we're gonna use the cheap shit. This reminds me a lot of some of the shoulder surgeries that I perform. After rotator cuff surgery, patients can be immobilized in a sling for up to six weeks. Patients hate it and it is really uncomfortable. It is particularly awkward for sleeping and often patients cannot sleep normally in bed. They have to contort themselves in strange positions with pillows in order to be able to get to sleep. And they are always so pleased when they are eventually able to sleep normally again. Much of what we do in orthopedics requires temporary immobilization after surgery to secure what we have done and to prevent undue stress on the surgical implants before healing is complete. Our goal with immobilization is to protect our work. It is typically not for patient comfort. So we get it but we do what we gotta do to help the patient heal properly. If it means you gotta sleep on your head, then nah, you gotta sleep on your head. <laughs> uh, I was trying to see whether this was a Photoshopped image or not. I am still not sure. However, if it is not, this surgeon has a sense of humor, but is also playing with fire. Hot, hot. Most certifying colleges would frown upon this if it came to their attention, and a patient who did not appreciate this humor might have cause to file a complaint or to take medical legal action. While these sutures are not permanent in nature, someone could argue that they were disfigured by this stitch pattern. It is a reach, but I could see it happening. There was a recent case in 2013 where a transplant surgeon carved his initials internally with cautery into a patient's liver at the completion of a surgery. This did not have any clinical impact on the surgery performed and the initials weren't visible externally. The initials were, however, noted in the patient in a later surgery. This surgeon was charged with assault to which he pled guilty. He subsequently resigned his position at the hospital where he worked. This is all to say that stuff like this is shady and should be avoided at all costs. So I'm not sure whether this one is poking fun at Ben Carson specifically, just black surgeons, neurosurgeons, or just surgeons in general. I'm going to assume it's the first. Ben Carson is a Republican politician who was a presidential candidate in 2016 and part of Trump's cabinet between 2017 and 2021. Prior to his career in politics, he was a neurosurgeon at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He has written over 100 neurosurgical publications, 
and has pioneered several groundbreaking surgeries in pediatric neurosurgery. He was the subject of a 2009 autobiographical film entitled Gifted Hands, where he was portrayed by Cuba Gooding Jr. By most accounts, he was a gifted surgeon. Neurosurgeons perform very delicate and precise surgery, so they generally must have very good, steady hands. So if anyone was able to play the game of surgery successfully without setting off the buzzer, it would probably be this guy. I love this one. I'm a big fan of technology and I have loved the idea of maglev trains since I first learned of them as a teenager. I have always hoped to see one and I hope to ride one myself one day and it is certainly something on my bucket list of experiences. Most people have heard of the saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. It was an exceptionally bright idea to use this figure of speech in a literal sense to levitate high speed trains. Absolutely. Genius. There is one drawback, of course. A large amount of doctors may be required for each train to provide enough levitational force to elevate the train. Since each doctor takes a minimum of six years to train at enormous expense, the cost of creating an MD-based maglev train would likely be exorbitant. Consequently, I can imagine that the cost of riding this train would be very, very high. I'm not even sure who would be able to afford tickets on this train. Not to mention, it is not clear what the durability of the doctors used to elevate the train will be, so maintenance costs could be exceptionally high as well. While this is a really bright idea, it may turn out to be cost prohibitive to most riders. As a community surgeon, I don't have the opportunity to teach medical students or residents that often. However, I can clearly remember my time learning as a medical student in a teaching institution. In this setting, there was very limited real estate around the surgical table. For every surgery, you have the surgeon, the scrub nurse, and the assistant. At teaching hospitals, you also have a resident or fellow, and sometimes both. That's like five to six people standing shoulder to shoulder, looking down at a surgical field that is often only 10 centimeters in length. It becomes very difficult for everyone to get close to the surgical field to see what is going on. Everyone wants to learn, but it is hard for everyone to see. Medical students are the lowest <laughs> rung on the medical ladder, so they are the ones who are farthest away from the surgical field. So yes, it is literally actually like this when students are watching in the OR. Of course, we always have to make sure that they don't contaminate the surgical field or that they don't limit us <clears throat> from performing the surgery effectively. So although they are crowding the surgical field trying to get to see, we are often pushing them back so that we have room to work. Anybody can herd cattle holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, oh, that's another thing altogether. Ah, the struggles of medical education. It's a lot like trying to herd cats, actually. A lot. Any surgeon can relate to this one. Surgery is an inherently risky business. We are cutting people open, which increases the risk of infection, and we are performing procedures inside of the body, which can result in serious complications. It is indeed a high stakes game. As surgeons, we prepare for each surgery by going over the patient's medical chart, reviewing the surgical technique, and formulating an operative plan. We also make sure that we have a contingency plan, just in case things go During the surgery, we do everything that we can to make sure that everything unfolds the way that we have planned before surgery. However, this is not always the case. Sometimes things just don't go the way that we want. A bone breaks where we didn't want it to, a surgical instrument breaks or is dropped on the floor. Perhaps a surgical tool doesn't work the way it's supposed to. All of these things happen and we have to deal with it. In addition, surgeons are human. We are not robots. Sometimes humans make mistakes for any number of reasons. Anyone who tells you different is lying. If you operate enough, you will make an error. Usually these errors are small and readily correctable. However, sometimes an error can be serious and have grave consequences. You never want that. And should an error like that occur, it is hard not to feel like you just want to crawl under a rock to die. I like this one a lot because it speaks to the dual nature of orthopedic surgery. On the one hand, we are highly trained medical professionals that expect patients will entrust us with their medical care at a time when they are most vulnerable. We wear all the trappings of cogent erudite specialists in the clinical setting. 
But on the other hand, in the operating room, we are like surgical gorillas wielding power tools. I often say to people when they ask what I do that I am a glorified carpenter that gets to work inside of the body. I use the same tools and much of the same techniques that carpenters do day to day. Much of the work that I do is quite physical in nature as well. So although there is a lot of precision work with mere millimeter tolerances, there is also a lot of physical labor on a gross scale, sawing, hammering, chiseling, drilling, etc. And in some case, there is even wrestling we are trying to reduce a fracture or dislocation back into position. But don't worry about it. I did stay at Holiday Inn Express last night. This one had me cracking up. This is so true of our anesthetic colleagues. Generally speaking, most cases are relatively routine in terms of the anesthetic process. The anesthetist will put the patient to sleep, although this is becoming less and less common these days as a result of regional anesthesia at the beginning of the case, maintain the patient in an anesthetic state during the case, and then wake them up at the completion of the case. Much like flying a plane. Take off, fly, and then land. Like a plane, during the flight, the patient is on autopilot, with the anesthetist doing nothing other than watching the instruments. If the case is long, like on a long flight, the anesthetist might take this time to do other things, like exercise, read journal articles, listen to lectures, etc. while the machine runs the anesthesia. Sometimes anesthetists might catch a few <sighs> winks during this time. Generally, this is not a problem. In a plane on autopilot, should turbulence occur, the pilot needs to be ready to take control of the plane at a moment's notice to prevent an accident from occurring. The same is true of the anesthetist in the OR when intraoperative problems occur, as long as they are awake, that is. When things go sideways, the anesthetist needs to be awake and ready to take control of the flight to prevent sudden catastrophe. No gas passer wants to wake up from a nap to bells and excitement in the OR because that would mean that there is a serious problem at hand. I enjoyed this one a lot and I think that this is a great one to end on. As I mentioned before, surgery is a high stakes game with a lot of stress. Every time we perform surgery, we have to be on our A game. We have to be alert and focused on the task at hand. We have to be confident in our knowledge and skills to perform the planned surgery and to lead the operating room staff through the plan that we have prepared. We also need to be confident in our ability to respond to unexpected events. For routine cases, this is not a problem. However, for big, complex, challenging cases, this can be difficult at times. None of us, none of us wants to make a mistake or forget something that is an integral part of the surgical plan. So we have to remain diligent in all that we do. Sometimes self-doubt or nervousness can creep in and draw our attention away from what we are doing. Positive self-talk is a part of the process of creating a favorable mental environment that facilitates our focus on the successful completion of the surgical plan. When things are particularly stressful, we are having a running dialogue with ourselves in our head to walk ourselves back from the edge of the cliff so that we can get back to the surgical plan. Yeah, surgery. It can be hella stressful, but I still love it. If you agree or disagree with anything that I have said, let me know in the comments. If you have a meme that you like, that you want me to explain or react to, send me a link on my socials. As always, that's been a word from Dr. Chris, not your everyday ortho. 